Welcome to the What Really Happened radio show. The history the government hopes you never learn. Here is your host, Michael Rivero. And aloha, America. Welcome to our show. It's Wednesday, September 18th, 2013, middle of the weekday, hump day, starting that long, slow glide down to Powhan Friday, and hopefully another relaxing weekend. I don't know. Last couple of weekends have been really stressful and intense with all this war mongering and everything else going on. We have a lot of stuff to talk about today. Our phone lines are open, 800-313-9443, 800-313-9443. Manny is sitting in our control room, ready to grab that phone the instant you call on in with your comments and observations and uh, questions about just what's going on, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that Washington, D.C. Naval Yard shooting because some additional information is surfacing. Apparently, this gentleman was receiving U.S. government payments for a partial disability that he acquired somewhere along the way. And uh, according to the European press, we're not seeing this in the American media, European press, uh, he was attending college uh, and uh, uh, apparently was on some kind of a subsidized uh, student loan or grant program uh, to fund his education. Uh, And uh, apparently uh, he had been a little upset over losing his job in January, but January is too long ago, and there had been some kind of uh, kerfuffle over uh, his payments being cut back because of austerity. But the bottom line here is that nobody can find any motive for Aaron Alexis to have done any of this stuff. They're blaming the guns, they're blaming violent video games, but none of that makes sense. And slowly, inexorably, The blame is narrowing on whatever prescription psychiatric medications he was put on by the Veterans Administration to deal with his mental problems, of which he had many. And, of course, nobody wants to talk about that in the corporate media. Don't want to lose those big pharmaceutical advertising contracts. Congress held hearings on the problem. They know it's a problem, but they chose to do nothing. Same reason. Big Pharma hands out all kinds of campaign checks every election season. Can't, can't bite the hand that feeds us there, people. But somebody wrote in with a very interesting observation, because on some states, the state paperwork for acquiring a firearm does include a question. Are you on prescription antidepressants? And if you answer yes, you will be denied a firearm. And at this point, I can't see a problem with that. And yet, we know an average of uh, one out of every five Americans are on these SSRIs, which means one out of every five police officers are on these mind-bending drugs, and they're allowed to have and use firearms and tasers and clubs and everything else they're using. And apparently, uh, there was an issue raised by the IACP Psychological Services section involving uh, uh, studies down in South Florida showing that police officers were being prescribed these SSRIs more and more and more. So the percentage of police officers on these dangerous drugs is higher than the national average. And they're being prescribed Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Luvok, and Lexapro. Many of these are on that list of the top ten violence-inducing medications. And this, is a, and this could go a very long way to explaining this surge in unreasonable police violence we're seeing against the American people. They're doping them up with these medications where they just say, ah, oh, I feel like smacking this person around, and they go ahead and do it. But, of course, the official U.S. government policy is, oh, we've got to blame the guns. It's the guns. It's really the guns' fault. You know, when it's a mass bombing, uh, you know, we blame the bomber. And when it's a mass Shooting, for some reason, they blame the guns. And it reveals a bias there. And, of course, Obama's already out there calling for gun control, you know, in the aftermath of the shipyard shootings, and he's waving the bloody shirts around uh, as hard as he can. Now, over in the Congress, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid is saying as much as he would like to have some kind of a gun ban, uh, the votes for it are not in the Congress. Because, again, especially in the House of Representatives, they're all up for re-election next year. And they all understand that the American people are very much opposed to gun control for a very simple, common-sense reason. Last year, drunk drivers killed 1,082 more people than gun owners did. 
But nobody is demanding that we take cars away from the majority of responsible, sober drivers because of the crimes of the few. Everybody understands that the cause of drunk driving accidents isn't the car, but a drug, alcohol, that affects the brain. And it is, in fact, already illegal to operate a vehicle while you're on drugs. But the government is taking the attitude that they need to take guns away from all the sane, law-abiding American people because of the crimes of a few who are taking or withdrawing from prescription antidepressants. Now, there's another factor to keep in mind. The shooting in the Navy Yard once more proved to us all that law enforcement are never present to thwart a crime. They'll gladly show up after it's all over, and they'll pick up the dead bodies and they'll pose for the news cameras, which they've been doing a lot of over the last couple of days. But they are rarely, 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 if ever, there in time to stop the crime from happening in the first place. Meanwhile, every year in this nation, 1.6 million crimes are thwarted in progress by law-abiding citizens with legally owned firearms. Little statistic that gun grabbers don't want you to think about. And one more little number you might want to keep on your little list of things to tell the gun grabbers. The average number of people who die when police stop a mass shooting is 18.25. The average number of people who die when an armed citizen stops a mass shooting is 2.2 which is why when a citizen stops a mass shooting and there's only two dead bodies, it doesn't rate in the news coverage. It's not bloody enough. Remember the wisdom of the corporate media. If it bleeds, it leads. If it thinks, it stinks. And, of course, the police and the the government don't want the American people to understand that they're actually much more safe and secure protecting themselves instead of sitting there on the phone, dialing 911, being put on hold an average of, what, 20 minutes? and waiting for the police to come up and deal with the bad guys, who are going to be done with their business and gone long before the police ever get there. So they're basically uh, hauling out all of the, uh, the, the gun grabber arguments here. And over at Daily Cost, and I don't really spend a lot of time with them because they're recognized as being an Israeli propaganda organ, they had an article out there, How to Ban Guns, a Step-by-Step Long-Term Process. And this article is all about, here's how you have to scare the people into surrendering their guns, here's you have to start with registration, and just step-by-step how they're going to disarm the American people. Now, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton from the District of Columbia is saying that the Navy Yard shooting was all the fault of the Second Amendment and saying it's the accessibility of guns that makes these things happen. No, it isn't. We have documented a link between SSRIs and acts of inexplicable violence. And again, for all the searching the CIA and FBI and everybody's doing, they can't come up with a reason why Aaron Alexis walked into that yard and just started killing people. He doesn't seem to have had a motive other than an adverse reaction to these prescription psychiatric drugs. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the week, somebody blew the whistle on these high school textbooks that literally rewrote the Second Amendment to make it sound like the right to keep and bear arms is only if you're in a government-controlled National Guard militia. It's a complete, deliberate misinterpretation of that. The latest update is the uh, parents in that school district are trying to bring the issue before the school board, and the school board is basically digging their heels in, saying that, uh, no, you have no authority to bring issues before the school board. We'll decide our own agenda, and we're not reevaluating the textbooks for another three years anyway, so please go away. Now, earlier today, I got uh, uh, some scans of a college textbook, in the mail, which is also attempting to rewrite the Second Amendment to make it sound like you're only allowed to have guns if you're in some kind of government-controlled militia or National Guard. And the United States Supreme Court ruled the Second Amendment reserves to the people, the individual citizen, a right to keep and bear arms equal to those of the military. They're lying to you again. We'll be Aloha, right America. Back. Welcome back to the show. A little bit of a breaking story. The Federal Reserve just announced they are going to continue quantitative easing, which is not a surprise to any of you listening to this show because, as I've said before, they're now hopelessly addicted to creating $85 billion in new money every month and dumping it all over Wall Street to keep them ticking along. And the proof of that is 
that as soon as the Fed made the announcement, the American stock market went just exploded upward to a new record high, and they're out there saying, see how good things are. And what it does is prove to us that the stock market is being propped up by all this instantly created money, because if the stock market were functioning the way it is supposed to, being representative of the manufacturing and agricultural productivity of the nation, it would have only been a minor blip. But as soon as the Fed announced, yes, we're going to go on pouring money on Wall Street, everybody started buying in. Went completely out of control over here. So, there we are. Um, Syria is unfortunately, sadly, still back on the agenda here. The New York Times was caught using another so-called expert uh, to try and say that, oh yes, the United Nations report on the use of chemical weapons absolutely implicates Assad. They're still out there pushing this whole thing, and the, the expert that they used uh, is, is an an, known anti-Assad commentator. They're, they're lining them up and saying, oh, this guy's independent. He doesn't actually work for us, but he agrees with us, so he's the expert we're going to use to bolster the argument. And again, the official U.S. claim regarding Syria and chemical weapons is absolutely absurd on the face of it. If you actually stop and think, which is going to make the government very, very nervous and afraid, by the way, it doesn't make any sense. The U.S. is claiming that Assad allowed United Nations chemical weapons inspectors into Syria. Then on the very day they arrived, launched a chemical weapons attack, not against the leadership of the hired mercenaries trying to oust him, but against women and children of the Alawite sect, who happened to be Assad supporters, right in front of those UN chemical weapons inspectors. And the gas attack also hit some of Assad's own soldiers. And what is missing from this obvious pile of USDA choice bovine excrement is a motive for Assad to do something that stupid. A chemical attack against women and children serves no military purpose. It certainly does not assist Assad uh, to carry out uh, an attack against his own supporters. And given that Assad's top priority is to prevent a direct U.S. military invasion, he is well motivated not to use chemical weapons, which would basically hand the U.S. an excuse to invade on a silver platter. Assad has no motive to use such weapons. He's winning the war against the hired mercenaries using conventional arms. And remember, last January there were emails leaked from a British defense firm, Britam, which confirmed the existence of a plan approved by the Obama White House to give chemical weapons to the rebels to use on civilians, let's get some women and children for the shock value, and frame Assad for it. So the U.S. and the rebels have a motive to use chemical weapons, but Assad does not. Meanwhile, speaking of the New York Times, remember we were talking last week about how it came out, the NSA, after violating the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, and actually a bunch of other amendments as well, breaking all the laws of the land, to spy on every single thing you do through your computers, your tablets, your smartphones, was simply turning over the raw take to Israel with no filtration. Israel's on the honor system that if they see something coming in from one of our elected officials, they'll just throw it away. And, of course, we know Israel's not going to do that. It's going to go into the blackmail file. Well, apparently, even though this story was big news all around the world, and certainly here in the independent media, New York Times kind of gave it a pass. And apparently, somebody actually contacted the managing editor of the New York Times, Dean Beckett, on Monday and said, why aren't you covering this? And he says, it's not significant enough. It's not significant. It's not surprising. You know, we're not going to waste energy chasing the small stories. Now, reading the comments regarding the New York Times' failure to cover this story and report it to their readers, it's obvious the public isn't buying this. It's just another cover-up for Israel's wrongdoing and the NSA's wrongdoing. Speaking of Israel and getting back to Syria, David Cameron is out there saying, oh, we've got to learn from the Holocaust and deciding what we're going to do with Assad. So they're waving the Holocaust card and Nazis and Hitler at us all over again. And there's something you need to understand very fundamental. As you hear about Great Britain is supporting military action in Syria, and France is supporting military action in Syria. Britain and France aren't supporting anything. 
the British government is supporting invasion of Syria. The French government is supporting the invasion of Syria, just like the U.S. government is pushing for an invasion of Syria. But the French people, the British people, and the American people overwhelmingly do not support another war for the bankers. Now, meanwhile, as the U.S. tries to somehow spin the U.N. Chemical Weapons Report, which does not assign blame, try and spin it to point the finger of blame at Assad, apparently Russia has acquired, working with the Syrian government, hard, concrete, factual evidence that, yes, it was the hired mercenaries who launched this chemical weapon attack, and they're preparing to take it up to the United Nations Security Council. And because of Russia's status as a permanent member on that council, the Security Council will have to look at the information. Meanwhile, Obama is preparing to go back to Congress to try and resell an invasion of Syria. They're trying to find a way to move the war forward. And I, I told you, even though we scored a victory and we, we called Congress and we said, no way, and Congress said, well, we can't do this, we're up for re-election. I told you they were going to come back and try and find some way to move this forward. Now, if you think about it, over the last 20 years, the United States government has made a conscious policy decision to stop spending money on the United States of America. Our roads are crumbling. Our bridges are collapsing. Something like 7,000 U.S. bridges are now deemed not structurally sound. No money on the infrastructure, cutting back on all the social programs, cutting back on education, and the money is pouring into the war machine. They have invested hundreds of trillions of dollars in building for a new global war. Money that they will never get back unless the war moves forward. And if the war fails, the U.S. economy, crippled by the war spending and the borrowing, is going to collapse. So you need to understand, from the point of view of the war hawks, whether it's Obama or John McCain or Kerry or any of these other people, in their minds, there is no choice. They must have the war by any means, fair or foul. And so this is another call to Rivero's Rangers. You've got to keep calling that Capitol Hill switchboard at 202-224-3121. Leave messages for your representative and your senators and say, no, no, no. We know you're lying about Assad's weapons of mass destruction, just like you lied about uh, Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. We do not support this war. We will vote you out of office next election if you move forward. You can call the White House comment line at 202 456 1111 and just leave a message for Obama. We know you're lying to us, and we will not support this war. We have to keep up the pressure. We have to shatter the government's firm confidence that they can continue to lie us into wars as they have for the past hundred years. Doubt is our most potent weapon against more wars and false flags. Silence is our enemy. You can also go to congress.org for other contact information of your representatives. You've got to keep up the pressure. The first side that quits loses. Hello, America, welcome back to the show. And I'm going to give you those two phone numbers. You ought to write these down and save them and just keep calling constantly. Get all your friends, family, neighbor to keep calling as well. Capitol Hill switchboard is area code 202-224-3121. That's 202-224-3121. The White House comment line is area code 202-456-1111. And just send the message. We know you're lying. We're not going to go along with another war. We refuse. Now, the Warhawks are still going to try and get that war. But what we need to do is send a message to the rest of the world that this federal government does not speak for the American people. They do not tell us what to think. We know they are lying about Assad using gas on his own people, just like they lied about Saddam Hussein having nuclear weapons, just like they lied about torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, just like they lied about the USS Maine being blown up by a Spanish mine. A government lie is not a unique occurrence. It is business as usual for this government, and it is time for it to stop. We're going to go to the phones here, Robert in Texas. Aloha. Robert, welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Mike, two quick questions. Uh, do the rating agencies uh, that rate uh, the uh, 
Wall Street, uh, or just excuse me, the United States government, have they dropped the credit rating to the point that pension funds can no longer buy these uh, uh, bundles that they sell on uh, uh, Wall Street to the, the pension funds? Uh, and then the other quick question, does Syria have a private central bank or a public our government central bank. Um, I think they have a, uh, a public central banking system. They're they're currently not showing any debt to either uh, the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. So they are delinked from the global banking cartel completely. Uh, as far as the Wall Street ratings agencies, I, I think they've dinged the U.S. credit rating a little bit, for which there was some retaliatory lawsuits involved. Uh, but at this point. Uh, hardly anybody is buying U.S. government debt any longer. And basically, they've come up with this scam where the Federal Reserve is just printing up new money and sending it over to the U.S. government in exchange for all those Treasury bonds the U.S. government prints up to send back. But they're basically just legalized counterfeiting, and we're getting into that Zimbabwe-style hyperinflation. And it's all just a gigantic scam, because all of this is treated as debt against future Americans, without right. our permission. And uh, uh, a lot of other countries are already starting to dump their U.S. Treasury bonds. There's a huge Treasury bond bubble. Uh, the, the U.S. government has printed up more Treasury bonds than there are Americans to work and pay it off. Right. And uh, we're going to be talking about that a little bit further because uh, th there's a major issue of a genuine real-life version of Rollover, which was a movie about how uh, the, the Treasury debt uh, could implode at any moment. And, and by the way, for all those nations around the world who are very concerned right now that the U.S. is leading the world into a global nuclear war, one of the most effective things they could do to derail it is to not roll over their treasury bonds anymore. When they come due, just simply say, hey, we want our cash right now. Right. That would okay, you've answered my questions. I appreciate it. All righty. Thank you very much. All righty. So uh, if you thought the situation uh, with Syria was over and done with, it isn't. The Warhawks are still trying to find some way to move this thing forward and try and get it into, uh, uh, into Syria. And they're already talking about Iran. Netanyahu's coming out here, end of the month, he's going to meet with Obama about what we must do about Iran. And remember, Iran has not launched a war of aggression in over 200 years. It is not their nature, as opposed to the U.S. and Israel, which can't seem to go for six months without bombing somebody or attacking somebody. Now, speaking of Iran, there's a very wonderful video that we found and we put up at the front page of whatreallyhappened.com. It's titled, Don't Tell My Mother I'm in Iran, and it's just a documentary of this gentleman visiting Iran and finding out that, hey, it may be a different religion, but it looks a lot like just ordinary people. They're playing basketball. They're doing rap music. Uh, we posted another article about, uh, uh, you know, uh, nightclubbing and, and, and the nightlife in Tehran. And the image of Iran that you have been fed by the corporate American media is, shall we put it delicately, highly Iraq, uh, inaccurate. This video, Don't Tell My Mother I'm in Iran, opens on an Iranian ski slope. They're out there skiing and shussing and stem Christies and all that other stuff. They're having a good time. They live, they, they look, they're people. They're ordinary people, just like us. And it's worth looking at that video. And we're going to try and find more of that to basically present to the American people in the world an image of these people we're being told we must hate and destroy. Now, I went over to YouTube... And I did a search for this same video. We've linked it from a different site from YouTube. Uh, over at YouTube, I found one copy, but I found records where it had been uploaded already four times and then deleted by YouTube. They don't want you to see that these are human beings on the other side of those cruise missile attacks. Meanwhile, of course, Obama has announced he will not meet with Iran's president in New York when the United Nations General Assembly convenes next week. I guess the attitude from the White House is, what's the point? <laughs> We've already decided we're going to invade Iran, and just talking is a waste of the president's precious time here. Very alarming development, uh, and this gets back to Syria. As you're probably aware, Vladimir Putin is now considered a global peacemaker, far more deserving of the Nobel Peace Prize than President Obama, over the deal they had for Syria to surrender their chemical weapons, and Syria has already signed and ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention. 
implementing the deal that the White House already agreed to. And now the White House is pulling back and saying, no, we need to change the deal. And they're making a big stink over the use of force option. They're now demanding it has to go back in there. The White House already agreed to a deal for Syria to surrender their chemical weapons, the Russian deal, with international observer oversight, but without the military option. And now they're trying to put it back in. They're trying to break the deal. And they're making a big deal about it because they already know use of force will never get through the United Nations Security Council. And so what they're building is an escape hatch where they can get out of the deal and say the war with Syria is still on. Because remember, this war in Syria and the war in Iran and the war on the rest of these places has got nothing to do with chemical weapons. It's all about forcing the world back onto private central banking, forcing the world back onto the petrodollar deal, forcing the world back onto Bretton Woods. That's what this is all about. And the problem we are dealing with right now is that the warmongers in government and Wall Street, from their point of view, the war is absolutely essential. There is no choice. They must get it, or all their little scams and enterprises are going to fall apart. And they are desperate to move this forward, which is, again, why it's so important for you to call everybody in Congress, the White House comment line, everybody in the media, and just keep sending the message, we don't believe you guys anymore. We have been lied to one too many times. We understand you are lying to get us into another war for the bankers. We won't pay for it. We won't support it. We won't allow our children to die in it. If you think invading Syria is so important, here's your rifle. Here's your parachute. We ran out of the desert camo, but we've got a bright day glow orange jumpsuit for you left over from Gitmo. Watch your head climbing into that transport plane, and we'll call Assad and tell him you are on your way to kick his butt all by yourself. And I think it would be a really good idea. Let's grab all these people, Kerry and McCain and Obama, who think war on Syria is so great. Let's find, send them over there. Drop them on parachute right into the middle of Damascus and say, go to it, have fun. Now, turning to the economy, we are hearing the, the beginnings of a battle in Congress over raising the congressionally mandated debt ceiling. Now, we know the U.S. government has already gone past the debt ceiling because over at the Treasury Department, the total federal government debt figure has sort of been hovering just below that mandated debt limit for about three months. And people were wondering what's going on. And then we find out, basically, the government has stopped making payments into the pension plans for their own federal government workers. So in addition to stiffing uh, Social Security recipients, which began for earnest in the Clinton administration, now the federal government is stiffing its own workers. And so Obama came out earlier today with a uh, press conference calling on business leaders, most of whose businesses are dependent on generous government spending, to demand Congress to raise the debt limit. And so maybe when you're up there calling and screaming that they're liars about war in Syria and you won't support that, you might also say, hey, no more debt limit. If you can't run this government in a business-like manner, it's time for you to go out of business. Because you realize every time the president starts asking to raise the debt limit, he is confessing to an utter failure to manage the nation's finances. He just wants another credit card to play with. And it's not a bad thing for him because it's your great-great-great-great-grandchildren who will pay it off. Will be. And right Aloha, back. America. Welcome back to the show here. And we're talking about Obama's uh, call on Congress to raise the debt ceiling yet again. We must have more borrowing. We must have more debt to keep the country going. And every time the president starts asking to raise the debt limit, he is admitting that he is an utter failure at managing the nation's finances. What he's doing is asking for Congress to authorize another credit card to play with. And he doesn't see it as a bad thing. Because he doesn't make the payments on that credit card, you do, and your children do, and your children's children do, and your great-great-great-great-grandchildren will be paying this bill off at interest in taxes taken for them for which no services are returned. And the fact that they have to keep raising that debt limit underscores the fact they cannot get their financial house under control. Obama has, for all intents and purposes, just admitted what we already knew. The U.S. government, lobbied and lured into higher mountains of debt by the Keynesians, is now too deep in debt to ever pay it 
off. More borrowing isn't the solution. The solution is the U.S. government declaring bankruptcy and going out of business to make way for a government with better fiscal responsibility. Let me give you an example about why this is a good option. Let's imagine for a moment that you go into a restaurant and you place an order for a hamburger. And the proprietor of the restaurant and the menu tell you the cost is $10 for the hamburger, and you pay $10 for the hamburger, and you get your food, and it's tasty and delicious, and it is well worth the money you paid for it, and you have no complaints. Then when you are done eating, the owner of the restaurant shows up at your table and apologizes profusely and explains that he underestimated the real cost of providing you with the hamburger he agreed to serve you, and he hands you a bill for an additional sum he had to borrow in order to provide the meal, plus accruing interest since the start of your lunch. Do you pay that? Of course not. You, the customer, entered into a verbal contract with the proprietor of the restaurant to provide you with your meal at the price agreed to by all parties prior to the transaction. Now, if the proprietor of the restaurant has miscalculated the cost of meeting his agreed-to obligation to the customer, is the customer obligated to cover the shortfall? No. Absolutely not. The proprietor of the restaurant is responsible for the error, and if he cannot meet his agreed-to obligations for the agreed-upon price, he should declare bankruptcy, go out of business, and make way for a new restaurant with better business management. That's just simple common sense. So let us imagine that you live in a nation, and you request some benefits, good roads, good schools, good hospitals. And the government tells you the cost is going to be $1,000 for the benefits. And you pay $1,000 in taxes for the benefits, and you get your benefits. And they're well worth the money you paid for them, and you have no complaints. Then when you have the benefits, the government shows up at your door, apologizes profusely, explains that it underestimated the real cost of providing you with the benefits it agreed to provide, hands you a bill for an additional sum it had to borrow from the bank where you keep your retirement savings, I might add, in order to provide the services plus interest since the start of your use of the benefits. Do you pay it? Of course not. You, the citizen, entered into a contract with the government to provide you with certain benefits and a certain agreed price prior to the transaction. Now, if the government has miscalculated the cost of meeting the agreed-to obligations to the citizen, is the citizen obligated to cover the shortfall? Well, the government's going to say yes, but I say no. The government is responsible for the error, and if it cannot meet its agreed-to obligations to the American people for the agreed-upon price, it must declare bankruptcy, go out of business, and make way for a new government with better fiscal management. Of course, the issue really isn't all that simple. The U.S. government has already spent trillions of the public's money not in the public interest and against the people's wishes to save Wall Street CEOs from having to go to prison for the mortgage-backed securities fraud. They've spent trillions more in war payments, extortion payments to Israel, and building the largest mass murder machine in the history of mankind. The government sold you a hamburger, took your money, and you didn't get a hamburger. You got something else. They say, we, we had to spend your money over here instead, and aren't we doing a good job? And then the government in desperation tells you that if you do not pay the higher taxes or allow the government to borrow more money from the banks, they in turn will refuse to repay the money they already borrowed from the bank where you keep your retirement savings and you will have no retirement, which they're already doing in Social Security and those federal retirement pensions. The government is constantly making the claim that we, meaning the American people, have already spent the almost $200 trillion that the federal government owes, and that therefore we, meaning the American people, must repay it. That is nonsense. No taxpayer alive now ever voted or otherwise agreed to allow the government to borrow money on their behalf and agreed to underwrite the resultant ruinous interest obligation. No citizen spent that money. The government spent it to keep promises it had no business making in the first place, to do favors for foreign governments, to wage pointless wars, and to buy get-out-of-jail-free cards for their Wall Street cronies. One need only look at the dilapidated condition of our roads, schools, and hospitals to see that precious little of the American people's money has been spent on the American people, who are now being told they must pay the costs of the government's generosity to Wall Street and the war machine. Now, the Federal Reserve Act, 
was voted into law December 23, 1913. This is the law that replaced our government-issued value-based currency with paper notes borrowed from a central bank at interest. And that interest has accumulated over the last century into the crushing debt we are pledged as slaves by the U.S. government to repay. Now, it should be noted that since the money creation authority was vested in the U.S. government by the Constitution, only a constitutional amendment could transfer that authority to a privately owned central bank. I would therefore argue that our current system of economics is illegal and unconstitutional. I would also add that we are now enslaved to the exact same sort of predatory banking system this nation fought a revolution to be free of. But the people who voted in that law, allowing the private bankers to transform the public currency from a public utility to a private money-making mandatory borrowing scam, are all dead. So is the president who signed that unconstitutional law. No taxpayer alive today listening to this show had anything to say about repaying any money the government borrows to keep its promises. We were not given any choice in that matter. It's been forced on us. It was manufactured for us by a government that spends the people's money not on the people, but on wars of conquest, gifts to Israel, and endless bailouts for Wall Street and European bankers. Now, you young people out there who are becoming voters and taxpayers this year have had no say at all about the almost $200 trillion debt our government hands to you and says, this thou shalt pay. From where I sit, it looks like indentured servitude to me, at best and at worst outright slavery. We the people did not borrow and spend that $200 trillion. We the people never had an opportunity to decide whether or not we're obligated to cover the bad debts of a government that gets elected by promising $10 hamburgers, only to tell us after election day that they really cost $15, and hey, you're on the hook for that additional five. It's time for this government to go away and re be replaced with something better. Because this government, no matter how much you work and sacrifice and pay, it, you can't stop the situation. Because we are enslaved to a private central bank that by design creates more debt than money with which to pay the debt. There is no way out of the trap as long as you play by the rules you've been taught to believe represent the way things should be. It's rule by compound interest. And it's no more legitimate a form of governance than rule by divine right or rule by slavery. And all three of these systems only work as long as you allow yourself to believe this is the way life is supposed to be. The only legitimate form of governance is self-governance. That was the founding principle of this nation. And Woodrow Wilson himself said, we lost that. We're not a governance of the majority opinion of Americans, but the duress of a few dominant financial interests. We'll be back after Phyllis Shapley. Hello, Aloha. Welcome back to hour number two of our show. And as the posturing regarding the debt ceiling continues, we're seeing stories like Obama administration starts preparations for shutdown. This is over at Associated Press. And... It start, it's really like professional wrestling. If you think about it, these, you know, the president and the Congress are going to get in the ring and they're going to sneer at each other and they're going to wear these funny little masks over there and they flex their muscles and slap each other around. But you know that it's really just all a performance. And we know in the end they'll raise the debt ceiling because to not raise the debt ceiling means they are out of a job. That's what's going on there. But Obama is saying, we're making preparations to shut down the government if the debt ceiling is not raised. Well, great if it happens. Good idea. Shut the federal government down. Let's start by shutting down the TSA, the Department of Homeland Security, the NSA, the Department of Defense, actually the Department of let's go bomb some other people and take their wealth, shut down the CIA and the FBI and every other government agency that makes war, spies on and harasses and loots the American people. Because they're not doing the American people any good whatsoever. Of course, we know what Obama is really talking about. He's going to shut down those few remaining services that the American people are willing to pay taxes for. Like education, maintaining the national infrastructure, 
because he wants to go on showering money, hundreds of trillions of dollars into wars of conquest, propping up Wall Street and providing more weapons to an already nuclear-armed Israel. And that's really the process we're seeing. The taxes are going up, and less and less of it is spent on you. And if you don't believe me, just walk around your local community and look at the dilapidated condition of this nation. Everything's dirty, it's not maintained, it's rusty, it's corroded, it's cracked, it's falling apart. That's the reality of what's going on here. According to the uh, census results, during Obama's first four-year term, real median income for Americans declined by $2,600 per year. It's been in a steady decline in the last five years. It's actually, our, our standard of living has been in decline for the last 30 years. Six million six hundred sixty-seven thousand more Americans are now living in poverty since the beginning of Obama's first term. A record 46 million are now considered poor in the United States of America. But we can spend all this money on war machines that don't work, like the F-35, and propping up Wall Street. Now, a story that we saw over in Blacklisted News is uh, the Treasury Secretary making a comment that sort of reveals how fragile and unstable the U.S. government finances are. Because when the U.S. government issues these treasury bonds and they sell them to other foreign investors, they run it as sort of a fractional reserve system. In other words, they are relying that people will just hold on to the bonds and roll them over. And every week... The Treasury rolls over approximately $100 billion in Treasury bonds. And he's out there on record saying, if holders of Treasuries decided that they wanted to be repaid in cash rather than to continue to roll over their investments, it would wipe out the entire cash balance of the federal government overnight. Now, there was a movie called Rollover, which was a, 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 an attempt to demonize the Saudis, but it basically underscored that this whole system is just propped up by all this paper and rigging to the point where it is very fragile. And if the rest of the world really wants, really decides they have to stop the U.S. from pushing forward into a global war of conquest, they have an easy weapon with which to do it. And that is, as their treasury bonds come due, Hundred billion dollars worth every week to just say, I want the cash instead. Now there's a video at the front page of whatreallyhappened.com. The headline reads, Gold Gone, Germany Baffled as Fed Bars Access to Bullion. This is from Russia Today, uh, and it reports on an aspect of Germany's attempt to repatriate their gold not reported in the American media, which is that Germany is seriously angry over what the Federal Reserve has done. And inside this report was uh, a revelation of yet another way the Federal Reserve is scamming the rest of the world. Apparently, during World War II, the Federal Reserve convinced nations in Asia and Africa, in order to protect their gold from the possibility of invasion by the Nazis or by Japan, that they would store their gold in the New York Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve issued New York Federal Reserve gold certificates in exchange for the gold bars. So they could carry the certificates around and say, this is our gold, it's safely in New York, we can't have it stolen by the Nazis and the Japanese when they invade. Then when the war was over, these nations went back to the Federal Reserve and presented their gold certificates, at which point the Federal Reserve said, oh no, those are obviously fakes. Those are counterfeits. We never issued those. And they kept the gold that they had taken from all those nations. Now, up in Canada, there's a lawsuit we need to keep an eye on called Comer versus Bank of Canada. Now, Canada managed to escape the clutches of private central banking all the way up to 1974. But in 1974, the money junkies got their wish, 
and the Canadian government surrendered to the private banking system the power to create money and issue it all as a loan at interest. And have you noticed Canada's decline since 1974? That's not a coincidence. That is the inevitable aspect of slavery to a private central bank. The bankers get rich, the nation and its people get poor. By design. So there's this lawsuit up there to try and force the Canadian government to rescind the charter for the Bank of Canada and to take back control of money creation, to turn the public currency back into a public utility. And we need to do the same thing here. We were talking the other day about how Hungary is now severing their relationship with the uh, global banking cartel. Said we don't want to do any more business with the IMF. We don't want to do any more business with the World Bank. We're just going to come up with our own currency for internal use. Go get stuffed. How they're going to sell you a war in Hungary, I don't know, but I'm sure one is in the planning. Uh, Egypt is apparently planning to cut their economy off from globalist banking influence. Maybe that was one of the fallouts of the counter-revolution against Mohamed Morsi, which looks more and more like a U.S. and Israel-sponsored counter-revolution than a genuine rejection of Morsi by the Egyptian people. Over in Greece, their foreign minister is saying Greeks cannot suffer any more austerity, and he's saying their nation has hit the red line of collapse. If any more money is taken out to give to the private bankers, if the Greeks are asked to surrender any more, the whole country is going to collapse and fall apart. And by the way, when that happens, those credit default swaps sold against Greek debt by Wall Street will come due and payable and begin a huge cascade. And these credit default swaps were recklessly sold by Wall Street. They made huge amounts of money off of it, and they do not have the cash reserves to pay the claims. We know what Wall Street's going to do. They're going to turn around to the U.S. government and say, we need another bailout. We're sorry. We meant well. We thought we'd learned our lesson from the 2008 mortgage-backed security fraud, but hey, you know, the temptation is just so strong out there. Now, I'm putting up a story. I don't have it up there yet. I'm going to finish it up over this next commercial break uh, where... Uh, Glenn Beck keeps coming back to this idea of his that the 2008 economic crash was intentional and an act of war. And apparently, according to a letter I got from a listener today, he was on that same topic again. And I'm going to talk about this when we come back with regards to a virtual computer-based 9-11. Hi, America. Welcome back to the show here. And we're talking about uh, how Glenn Beck in times past has tried to sell the idea that the people on Wall Street are really just a great bunch of Joes who would never, ever, ever, ever cheat anybody, even though we know that they do all the time, Bernie Madoff being a good example, and how the crash of 2008 had nothing to do with overinflated mortgage-backed securities and reckless selling of credit default swaps, and it was an evil plot by the Russian, Chinese, Syrian, Iranian, whoever we need to invade this week. And I'm sure it's a trial balloon they're trying to put out there. And again, we got an email from a listener who said Glenn Beck was back on that topic again today. I'm still trying to find a video of it. Now, as I've mentioned many times before, the people in Washington, D.C. and Wall Street are not the kind of people who will ever stand up and accept responsibility for what they've done wrong. They'll blame somebody else. It's the will of the gods or somebody else's fault. And, hey, we're starting a war, so don't talk about it anymore anyway. And I have postulated, as we talk about false flag attacks, that one very possible plan that may be under consideration in Wall Street and Washington, D.C., is a virtual 911, where at the point where the U.S. financial system is going to start coming apart, let's say that all those holder, foreign holders of Treasury bonds decide not to roll them over next week, that the U.S. government would intentionally crash the computers of the financial system to erase all the records and say, hey, we don't know who we owe money to. Guess you're just out of luck. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Talk to your insurance carrier. And blame it on Iran or Russia or China. And so when I hear anybody in the corporate media trying to claim that the crash of 2008 had nothing to do with the financial shenanigans of the bankers and that it was an evil plot by the designated enemy of the day, 
it makes me wonder if they're still considering uh, trying that stunt. Meanwhile, uh, even the corporate media is carrying the story that Russia is now up at the UN Security Council presenting their evidence that in point of fact the August 21st attack using chemical weapons was carried out by the hired mercenaries. And the American corporate media is trying to say, oh, you can't listen to the Ru they're Russians, you don't want to listen to them. Remember, they're all secretly commies. They all secretly worship Stalin and Lenin and all this other stuff out there. But uh, again, I don't need Russia to tell me the rebels did it. Logic tells me the rebels did it for reasons I've already abundantly made clear on this show here. And, uh, you know, showing that uh, members of the United States uh, Congress uh, are capable of throwing childish tantrums uh, apparently some U.S. Senators are now calling on the Obama administration to freeze the assets of three major Russian banks that are operating inside the United States of America, ban all activity by Russian banks in the U.S., and to basically refuse their employees' entry to the country because they suspect Russia might be doing business with the Assad regime. Of course they are. Russia and Syria are allies. Of course they're doing business. So basically, they're just throwing a tantrum out there. They're, they're trying to basically take attention away from the fact that the U.S. government got caught lying again to start a war. Russia called them on it. Russia created a deal to avoid war, and now the U.S. is trying to back out of it. They're raising on a busted flush here. So we're going to shut those Russian banks down here. And again... The logical thing for all these other countries to do is to not roll their treasury bonds over anymore. Next time they come due, every Thursday, every week, about $100 billion of those things uh, come due. And the rest of the world just says, give us our money. Don't give us another treasury bond. Those things are worthless. There's a treasury bond bubble. Just give us the cash. And we want it in gold. We want our gold back from the vaults. Now, let's talk about uh, Fukushima a little bit, because uh, apparently in the aftermath of the typhoon they just went through, uh, it is starting to surface that vast amounts of highly radioactive water were just dumped in the Pacific Ocean, uh, even ahead of the typhoon, in order to prevent the overtopping and, and possible destruction of the storage tanks, they just emptied them into the ocean. And... Apparently, according to Ted Gunderson, the boron that is in the cooling fluid used to try and draw away the residual heat from the spent fuel rods has been exhausted. And there's a concern that if the spent fuel rods get too close together, as the ground starts to subside, they can start having a nuclear chain reaction. I'm already of the opinion that the recent increase in radioactivity coming up out of the ground is because there is a spontaneous fission reaction taking place down there in the ground underneath Fukushima. Even the New York Times is now reporting that uh, experts are saying molten fuel may be underground beneath the Fukushima reactor buildings and that, of course, there's no way to get it out. There is no way to get it out. It is far too hot. Even if you built a gigantic digging machine to just try and scoop it all out, the scoop would melt. story that we're seeing out of naturalblaze.com, your days of eating Pacific Ocean fish are over, which is a shame because here in Hawaii, that's where all of our fish comes from. And we're very, very concerned about that. And I've gone back to doing daily uh, atmospheric radiation monitoring, and I'm not seeing anything yet. Uh, but we're hearing from other people that uh, the radiation here in Hawaii is probably going to start getting to be problematic uh, to the point of warning people not to go swimming uh, starting in 2015. And boy, oh boy, is that going to help our already damaged tourism industry after TSA and Fukushima radiation that's already arrived and molasses in Honolulu Harbor. Now, over in Colorado, we're getting some very, very bizarre stories. Apparently, FEMA uh, has ordered a volunteer group that were using their own drones to try and see where the flood damage was occurring from the air to shut down 
and go away. FEMA shut them down. And a lot of people are scratching their head. What's going on? Is there something going on with the flooding that FEMA doesn't want the American people to see? And inevitably, it comes back to the issue of all those fracking wells. And they're now estimating that somewhere around 1,000 of those wells have been compromised by the floodwaters. And tanks containing those highly toxic fracking chemicals have ruptured. Pipelines carrying the fracking chemicals have ruptured. And it's contaminated all that flood water which is going to be contaminating groundwater, meaning drinking water, all the way down to wherever that water finally drains away to. And this is a, an environmental disaster on the same scale as the Gulf of Mexico, possibly even worse. And so the whole question of whether fracking was getting into the drinking water from the wells deep down is it's almost moot. Now we know for certain those fracking chemicals, which are carcinogenic and cause all kinds of human illness, are now going to be in the Colorado drinking water. In that flood zone and everywhere downstream from it. And based on that story that we had the other day where depleted uranium is being ground up and used in the fracking fluid, and I can't think of a reason why they would do that, other than fracking is now being used as a convenient toxic waste dumping solution. We're going to send down the fluid to frack the rock, and hey, we've got these tanks of other chemicals that we, we can't get rid of. Let's just add them into the mix and just pump it into the earth where it'll never be a problem again. It's a problem again. We'll be back America, after this. Welcome back to the show. We're going to take a phone call here. Alex in Texas. Aloha, Alex. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Aloha, Mike. Uh, happy Wednesday to you. Uh, I was calling because uh, I was uh, taking note on uh, uh, some of your uh, articles that you have up. And I'm, I'm just wondering, just looking at the macro version of everything, um, you know how you say that there's, uh, there's uh, uh, lies in Washington that will end the party and then there's lies in Washington that they tell on each other? Well, what I'm wondering is, how about if all of what, because yesterday you had a caller call in about uh, uh, power struggles, and mm -hmm. um, I, I just thought about, you know, what if everything is just one big power struggle and the people who actually have the power, which is us, uh, are being manipulated in order to uh, kind of like how an equalizer is on, a, on, a, on one of those uh, MIDI machines that you could just move each lever up to make mm -hmm. it sound a little higher. Mm -hmm. You know, what if, what if each what if each thing that's happening is a, a result of those uh, intelligence agencies trying to produce events to create a, a, a climactic consciousness around people so that their plans could be taken well ahead? And the reason I say this is because, I mean, the, the things that, are, that these people are saying are, are bordering on ridiculous to the point where you're just like, how would you still call the dignitary? You know what I mean? No, I, I hear what you're saying, but the, what's going on here is what Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, referred to as the global political awakening of the people. Uh, because if you go back and you look at, for example, since we're coming up on the 50th anniversary, the John F. Kennedy assassination, and you look at the official story back then, it is just as ridiculous and silly as what we've been told more recently. But back then, the American public were very naive. They trusted their government and their corporate media, and they would simply accept what they were told, and they wouldn't think about it or look at it. And so it worked back then. Uh, and yes. what, we, what we had, I mean, there's always manipulation going on. The CIA was running Operation Mockingbird in uh, uh, the TV news and corporate news network. I ran into some of those bozos at CBS TV City uh, many many years ago, uh, and they're, they're trying to play the game by the rules that used to work, but they don't work any longer, and that's why they're all of a sudden feeling the frustration, because the American people aren't willing to just say, oh, Assad gassed his own people, yeah, go ahead and kill him, which very obviously they said no, because we know we were lied to about all those other wars. And so what has changed is the awareness of the American people and the people of planet Earth regarding the true nature of government and finance, and realizing that it is not this wonderful little society for the care uh, of the ordinary people that we were all brainwashed it was in school. What, what, do you think, what do you think is happening within the military ranks that's actually, and the intelligence ranks, 
that's actually bring shedding some light to a, to a lot of these things that that are is making our servicemen say, you know what, no more. Because I really think that that's where the buck has stopped. I don't think that they can get any military action because our 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 guys are just refusing to do it. There is a and there's a you're, you're right. There's a huge resistance within the military, uh, especially regarding Syria. Uh, because the American soldiers, uh, e even if they buy the propaganda, they don't want to be fighting on the side of Al-Qaeda all of a sudden. Uh, it was a very reckless thing to try and suggest that they do so. Uh, within the military high command, they understand uh, war with Iran will mean war with Russia and China, and they also understand that the U.S. is military and economically exhausted and will not be able to support a prolonged conventional war of attrition, which is exactly what Russia is threatening in both Syria and Iran. And so they're just as aware as anybody else that uh, f uh, continuing along this path is going to, in fact, risk a nuclear war on both sides, and they're not happy about that at all. Within the intelligence community, I'm sure most of the senior analysts understand very well uh, that uh, the propaganda war has gone off the track and that the United States is probably going to lose this next war if it's, uh, if it's allowed to go any further. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate your effort, and uh, thanks for keeping us so well informed. All right, well, good one. thank you very much, and please share what you know with who you know. We're going to switch over to Obi in Colorado. Aloha. Obi, welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi. I just wanted to call and comment on the fracking thing. I worked in the oil industry for 15 years from 84 to 99, and I can tell you for a fact chemical companies made a deal with the oil companies to pump chemical waste down into wells that they were working in, old abandoned wells, to skirt EPA regulations and, you know, th the things involved with properly disposing of chemicals. And, you know, fracking is not a new technology. It's been around for a long time, and all you really need to frack is mud. And, I, you know, that process is not that hard. It's just sand and water, and they pump it down in the well, you know, to do the fracking, they don't need all those chemicals to do that process. Well, I'm I'm not surprised. And the the problem with fracking and using it as a toxic waste disposal uh, is they're they're doing it on the idea that hey, we're going to pump it down into the ground and the problem has gone away. And no, it isn't because we already know it's seeping up to the surface. We've had this horrible Colorado flooding situation. And the problem is it's a one-way process. Once you've pumped all those toxic chemicals down into that subterranean strata a 1,000 feet down, there's no way to just pump it back out to fix the problem. It is there permanently, and future generations of Americans are going to be drinking that stuff in their drinking water unless Nestle succeeds in saying, oh, you can't get water out of a tap. You will buy your purified water from us at a huge markup. Well, that, and that's correct, And but the, they've been pumping those chemicals down in the wells for 40 years. It's not, it's not something new. It's been going on for a long time. Well, I, I, I think it's become an issue because, I mean, the, the prevalence of it. I mean, it's been going on for 40 years on a small scale, but now it's just everywhere. You look down at uh, America through Google Earth, and you just see these networks and networks of all these fracking wells. <clears throat> and the thing is, they're, they're already pulling so much natural gas out of the ground, they're having to burn off something like $100 million worth of it in open flames in order to prevent the surplus from driving the prices back down again. Well, that, that's a normal process with, with retrieving crude oil anyway. That's been happening for, you know, 50, 60 years. They've been burning off more of that natural gas than they sell. And, you know, that, that's an old process. You can go out to any of the wellheads where they're pumping a lot of the oil up, and you'll see these huge jets of flames burning, and they're burning off the natural gas. Gee, I wonder what that's doing for global warming. Funny how we never hear about that. You know, it's all, oh, you've got to drive smaller cars. You've got to reduce your carbon footprint. And here we have all of these uh, oil wells and refineries and everything, just huge gouts of fossil fuel, you know, flame pouring into the air. No, the issue I was raising is not the crude oil wells, but the fracking wells specifically designed to extract natural gas. They're pulling up so much that there is a surplus that could, in theory, drive natural gas prices down. Uh, and uh, the, the article, and I think we posted this at whatreallyhappened.com yesterday, was that they were intentionally burning off the surplus in order to keep prices back up. And they're just 
huge flames into the atmosphere, carbon compounds going into the atmosphere, heat going into the atmosphere, and then they scream at us that, you know, hey, it's uh, your plastic bags are causing global warming. Well, you know, we can solve all that by paying Al Gore more money. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and, you know, but m most people aren't aware of it, but crude oil itself is a very thick fluid. It, it's like cold molasses. It's very, very thick, and it has to go through a lot of refining processes before it becomes that can of oil you put in your car. Yes, well, I, 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 you know, we used to have, well, we still do huge refineries down there in Southern California. We have a smaller refinery right here on the island of Oahu, and I, I understand it's, it's a very complex distillation, what they call cracking, which is just uh, using these tall static columns to let the different compounds separate out for extraction. Uh, but it, it is a complex chemistry, uh, and uh, uh, again, whether or not it's renewing from deep crust microbe or not, we're burning it up faster than those microbes can replace it. And when you stop and you think about the sum, it's estimated now some $40 trillion was spent to keep Wall Street from collapsing after that mortgage-backed security fraud. If we had taken that same money and put it into real research trying to generate real results for alternative energy, we could have had major, major breakthroughs, 90% uh, efficient solar cells, uh, hydrogen power. Uh, we could have bought thorium cycle nuclear reactors for 30 cities across America, but instead the money all went to prop up Wall Street's little Ponzi scheme and to start a war to force everybody onto that same Ponzi scheme. And they've really destroyed the future of this country by misspending all this vast amount of wealth. I mean, our nation's been plunged into unpayable debt, and we didn't really get anything tangible for it other than F-35 and all the rest of it. The, they have mismanaged this country completely from the beginning because nobody's maintaining the overview. Obi, thank you for the call and the confirmation on the fracking fluids, and we'll be back Hello, after America. Commercial. Welcome back to the show. And before we move uh, further, I just had a listener sent me in a postcard of the Longfellow Bridge in Boston, which uh, I was born in Boston, uh, been to it many times. It's a beautiful city. Uh, and I was shocked at how rusted and corroded and dilapidated this very historic bridge has become. And it is a reminder that in their rush to prop up Wall Street, the war machine, and foreign governments, that this government has abandoned taking care of this nation, and that is, of course, its constitutionally mandated job. They're supposed to be taking care of the United States of America and the American people. Not taking care of Israel, not meddling in other countries, not propping up the failed Ponzi scheme central bank, which is unconstitutional on the face of it. And what we're seeing now in terms of urban decay in places like Detroit is starting to spread to other cities. There's no money to keep the bridges repaired. There's no money to keep the roads repaired. We've got to buy bombs. We've got to buy F-35s. We've got to buy Bradley Infantry fighting vehicles. And we've got to buy lots and lots of cruise missiles and drones. We've been on a war economy now for 15 years. They won't admit it, but that's what it is. The wealth of the nation is being spent on the war machine. Now, when we look at the horrible state of the nation and the world, whether it's toxifying the Gulf of Mexico with uh, Corexit and oil, whether it's toxifying the eastern half of Colorado with fracking fluid, a.k.a. toxic chemical waste that nobody knows what else to do with, the disaster in Fukushima from those GE-built and designed reactors, and possibly Stuxnet as well. I am still hoping that somebody will recover some of those Siemens controllers and see if there's still any code inside the non-volatile RAM and see if Stuxnet was the reason the safety systems failed to work correctly on that disaster. Now, we understand people are motivated by self-interest. We understand corporations are motivated by their profitability and keeping their stockholders happy. The function of the federal government is to maintain the overview of what is best for the nation as a whole. And in that context, the U.S. federal government has failed completely and utterly. Everybody in Washington, D.C., they're out there pushing whatever their agenda is without regard to how it impacts anybody else, good or bad. We're pushing fracking because it's good for the oil companies. Well, it's bad for the water supply. Who cares? It's good for the oil company. And on and on and on. And that is really 
That's the failure of the federal government. They've lost the overview. They have forgotten their job as steward of the nation was to take care of the nation as a whole, not just this little block in Manhattan, not certainly not foreign governments, not just these little special interests. They're supposed to be keeping watch on the entire nation to keep the entire nation functioning smoothly, to keep the entire economy functioning smoothly, and not just for the 1%. And they forgot that job. They completely forgot. It's not their problem. Oh, we're just going to reap all this wealth. Ah, the people will figure out some way to replace it all. I'm going to take a phone call here. Jim in Georgia. Aloha, Jim. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Aloha, Mike. Uh, I'm talking about N- Nukushima. I call it Nukushima. It's a good name. I'm looking at a map, and it shows... It shows the ocean currents, and, uh, and you're lucky because what it does is it comes from Japan, it goes to California, then it goes around Hawaii, Hawaii, <coughs> Hawaiian, okay, and mm-hmm. then it goes back to the northern current takes it back to Japan again. So you're, you're going to circle there. It's going to yeah, circle. we're actually, because of the North Pacific gyre current, we're actually right. missing most of the radiation, but they're saying eventually because of the constant stirring of the ocean, it is going to get here. Uh, at very high levels, and uh, maybe along with our warnings about sharks and jellyfish, we're not going to have signs on the beach, no swimming today, radioactive. But, yeah, I feel sorry for you. Because what, what's good about it, it's not coming. It's just going in a circle there, so you keep it with you. Mm, well, the, the problem, of course, is contamination of seafood because, uh, you know, we've already lost the Gulf of Mexico for safe and healthy seafood. Now we've got the Pacific Ocean, which is the world's largest ocean and the world's largest source of fish for human consumption. And the problem is a a, a fish 10,000 miles away from Fukushima is going to be just as radioactive as a fish right next to Fukushima because they get contaminated at Fukushima and they migrate and swim all across the ocean. They've already caught salmon off the coast of San Diego that were dangerously uh, radioactive. And what's a shame is it's the food I like. It's the... the, uh, the flounder, the lobster. And yeah, the bottom like feeders, the bottom feeders especially, uh, are, right. are, you know, because a lot of these isotopes, because they are very dense materials, they tend to sinter down out of the surface water and collect on the floor of the ocean where things like crabs are going to pick them up. And uh, uh, like I said, I remember uh, the uh, Deadliest Catch show came out to Hawaii for what their end-of-the-year wrap-up, and I was invited down to the set by a member of the crew who's a fan of the website, And off the air, away from the camera, uh, these fishermen were saying their worst fear was that somebody was going to go down and pick up a crab and hold a radiation meter to it and post the video on YouTube. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Michael. All right. See you later. All right. Let's get on to the global warming hysteria. They're trying to fan that one up again. They want to sell you the idea that you have to pay a carbon tax to save the world from your sins. Well, you know something? I'm pretty much sure that my audience had nothing to do with the state the world is in right now. You personally did not go out and melt down those Fukushima reactors. You didn't go out and blow up the deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. And you didn't start the floodwaters and uh, have less than standard piping and tanking and the fracking chemicals so that they were uh, easily ruptured. It is abuse by corporations and short-sighted money junkie thinking that has brought all this stuff down, and you're not responsible for it. They're just trying to create a new danger like Saddam's nukes and Assad's gas and human-caused global warming. It's just more of the same stuff. And it has become so obvious that all the prognostications from the carbon Nazis have failed to come to pass. The world is not getting warmer. Greenland is not losing its ice cap. The world's oceans are not climbing, rising. We've had several hard winters in a row. Years after the carbon Nazis were going to say snow was a thing of the past. The Arctic ice extent this year is 67% larger than it was last year. We're seeing articles like in the Telegraph, which was out there with the banner about global warming, and now they're saying, yeah, the top climate scientists admit the global warming forecasts were wrong. Golly gee shucky, well we knew it was all fraudulent from the climate gate leak where all these emails and actual computer code were leaked out of the Hadley Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia which made it clear they were pushing this agenda and using fakery. Because the more they pushed human caused global warming, the more funding they would get from Al Gore and his associates. 
Science is driven by money. It's the golden rule of science. Whoever has the gold decides the science. If you're a scientist and you write a, uh, a report, a paper, saying, I noticed this interesting phenomenon and it really doesn't affect anything, but it's just interesting and you'll get published and that will be it. But if you write a paper that says, I've discovered this interesting phenomenon, and if left unchecked, it will mean the end of the world, and you'll have media coverage and funding coming in. Scientists want the media limelight as much as any movie star or rock star. And so now they're, they're talking about, well, there's obviously a pause in global warming. They're not willing to surrender the idea that the world's getting warmer, but they're now admitting, yeah, there seems to be a pause. It seems to be getting cooler for some strange reason. Now, from 1997 to 2013, the carbon Nazis were predicting the global temperature would rise six-tenths of one degree centigrade. Oh, there's a reason to hit the alarm bell, and in point of fact, it didn't happen. There has been no temperature increase. Another story that we got out of uh, Stephen Goddard, satellites observing Antarctica and monitoring its temperature have detected no heat increase since they started keeping an eye on it with satellites. It's just not there. We're going to take a break for Phyllis Shafley and commercials, and we will be right back. Erica, welcome back to the show. And before we get back into uh, Climate Gate. Uh, we're looking at the corporate media, and they're just waxing rhapsodic over the amazing performance of the American stock market uh, following the Federal Reserve's announcement that they were going to continue quantitative easing. There was not even a taper. They're just going to keep on creating that $85 billion a month and pouring it all over Wall Street. And, of course, the stock market exploded upward, obviously driven by the bank issues. The bank stocks are the ones that were just soaring upward and dragging the rest of the market with it. And they're out there saying, huzzah, huzzah, the economy is doing well. No, it isn't. Yes, it's a record high on the Dow until you correct for inflation. And you will see that the stock market's actually been losing real value for close to 10 years now. But more than that, looking at that cliff edge, when the Fed announced they were going to continue quantitative easing, is advertising to the world that the stock market is, in fact, being propped up completely by all this quantitative easing. That there isn't any real value in there to sustain these high stock prices. And I think after the euphoria of those people who bought in the morning and sold in the afternoon is over, they're going to realize that how the market responded to the Fed's announcement betrays how dependent the stock market is on continued money flowing from the Federal Reserve, all of it technically alone to the American people at interest. But how dependent the stock market is on this continued life support. Got a giant IV tube and a needle from the uh, Federal Reserve over to Wall Street, keeping it alive. And yes, they got the, uh, the corpse to twitch around a little bit today, but that doesn't mean it's healthy. So, anyway, getting back to climate gate. As I was saying before, we went to the commercial break. Uh, satellite data has been collected on Antarctica for, well, quite some time now. And since the start of satellite records on Antarctica, there is no detectable warming. None at all. Remember, oh, Antarctica is going to melt and it will raise the uh, Earth's oceans and drown the coastlines if you don't pay a carbon tax and bow toward Al Gore three times daily. And already the uh, carbon Nazis are out there trying to spin it. And I couldn't believe when I saw this story. And I, I, for a moment I thought it was from The Onion. But it isn't. This was over at natureworldnews.com where the new spin is that Antarctica is melting but it's melting from the bottom up, and that's why you're not seeing any temperature increases on the surface. Well, here, I thought that their claim was that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was resulting in atmospheric warming, and now they're saying it's warming coming from inside the Earth, which obviously we humans are not responsible for. And we, this is a continuation of what we saw before when they were predicting, oh, this was going to get warmer, the oceans are going to get warmer, the ice is going to get warmer. We don't see it. Oh, it's hidden. That, that extra heat is hidden in the bottom of the ocean, which is nonsense because hot water rises and cold water descends. 
They're just saying anything they can to keep this hoax going. They lied to you. Again. In fact, we are, at this point in history, hard-pressed to find anything this government and corporate media have been 100% truthful about. The only thing that we get from the media that we should have any inclination to trust are the sports scores and the weather, and they're not even that good on the weather. Now, as I mentioned before, the Arctic ice has increased 67% over last year. That's a major, major increase. The carbon Nazis are saying, well, it may look whiter, but it's really a lot thinner. They're just saying anything they can to keep pushing this global warming mantra, and none of the real-world data is living up to their predictions. And as we documented in our climate page, uh, our climate gate page, all along there was fraud and deception taking place. We have a photo of one of the official NOAA temperature monitoring stations sited right next to a trash incinerator. Gee, I wonder if they're recording higher temperatures there. Over the, the first few years of that whole global warming hysteria, NOAA, citing budgetary constraints, shut down their temperature monitoring stations out in the cooler rural areas and relied on temperature monitoring stations inside cities, which tend to be hot places. And we've got photos of these temperature monitoring stations in the hot air outflow from building air conditioners. But this last Arctic ice extent broke the record for single-year ice growth. Now, how do you know if you're dealing with science versus propaganda? It's really very simple. If somebody is a scientist and they're being scientific and they're looking at scientific method and they've proposed a theory and you come up with experimental evidence that says the theory doesn't work, a real scientist will say, hmm, okay, I guess we've got to look at that again. And you go back and refine the model and do more experiments and try and find out what's going on. When you're dealing with propagandists who say, we have declared this is so, and you come up with evidence that contradicts it, they get upset. You're a climate denier. You hate the earth. You want us all to broil to death. That's how you tell the difference between real science and a propagandist. Real scientists understand they can make mistakes. Real scientists understand that new data may challenge old assumptions. Real scientists will take that new data and say, okay, we've got to revise our model. The whole point of the scientific method is the recognition that individual scientists can be swayed by personal bias, by religion, by financial pressures. Scientific method is a tool to validate what scientists say independent of the individual scientist. And one of the hallmarks of the Carbonazzi propaganda was when we had all these environmentalists coming out with saying our data shows the world is getting warmer and people would say can we look at the raw data and they said oh we erased it we didn't have storage room on our computer so we threw away the raw data just take our word for it this is what's going on meanwhile over in the European Union their climate commissioner is out there saying well even if the science was wrong and it's not getting warmer We've decided the policies we've imposed involving carbon credits and carbon taxes and whatever was the right thing to do. We're doing the right thing, even though the reasons for doing it don't exist. They just they want to hang on to the money and the control over your lives. That's what it was all about. We're going to take a phone call here. Scott in Wisconsin. Aloha, Scott. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Scott, are you there? Okay, I guess we're Okay, he dropped. All right, Scott. Well, be that way. See if I care. Now, down in Peru, they've been hit with another major uh, cold storm. Uh, They're just coming out of winter there. They're into their spring. And uh, uh, apparently they've been hit with the coldest temperatures in a decade. And they've declared a state of emergency in, uh, in Puno. We're seeing this all over again. Now, I want to get back to the story about the so-called Media Shield Act that is working its way through Congress. And ostensibly, this is trying to restore uh, legal protections to journalists in the wake of the scandal where the Department of Justice was spying on reporters, getting their phone list, trying to get their contacts. The problem with this is 
that they're trying to make it selective. They're trying to arrogate to themselves the right to say who is a journalist and who is not. In other words, Dianne Feinstein is trying to turn the First Amendment right to freedom of speech into a special privilege bestowed by the government. The government gets to decide who a real journalist is. These multi-million dollar salaried talking heads over at the networks, they're real journalists. You should listen to them. And those people working for pennies over there at Republic Broadcasting, they're not real journalists, so you shouldn't pay attention to them. And that is not the spirit of the First Amendment. The First Amendment grants to every single American an equal right to speak out against the wrongdoing of the government and not be interfered with. We've got to take a break for commercials. Aloha, we will be America. Welcome right. back to the show here. We're going to go back to the phone. Scott in Wisconsin is back. Welcome. Aloha. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. How you doing, brother? Just checking in with you. You know, Mike, when you uh, were telling about that new uh, quantizing debt that they came out with, I laughed. I have to laugh. Mike, it's the hot air balloon. You're exactly right. There's nothing to back it. And it, what you got to understand is this: the, the furry market is a hot air balloon. Mm-hmm. And what they just did today was take the tire pump out to the tire, that which was low on air, to pump it back up a little bit higher. I, I, you got to laugh, Mike, because this is a situation that it's like a record player it goes round and round and round and round, quantitation one, two, three. And yet we're going farther in debt, and yet the American people are waking up. So all they did was turn the heat up on the helium balloon today because there's nothing to back it. It's fascism, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't surprised that they come out early like this to to, to say this and that. So I just wanted to call in and say that. And if you want to comment, thanks a lot. Take my call, Mikey, and God bless. All right, you got it. Well, uh, like, like I mentioned many times in the past, the stock market has become dependent. Uh, Wall Street's become dependent on this constant cash infusion. It was adopted as an emergency measure. Now they're addicted. They can't stop. Every time they talk about taper, the market starts to decline. And the fact that it shot up so much following the Federal Reserve announcement only underscores how dependent the illusion of prosperity on the stock market is on that constant cash infusion of $85 billion a month. And every time the Federal Reserve creates that new money out of thin air, it is taking real purchasing power away from you, the American people, by inflating away the value of the money you already worked for and put in your pocket. You do not have control over the value of your money. Now, when this nation was started, the dollar was a weight measure of silver. And once that silver was in your pocket, There was nothing the government or the banks could do to change its value. You had control over the value of the money that you worked for and earned, and they couldn't change it. With the arrival of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve notes and the end of uh, silver or gold-backed money, the value of your dollar is what the government and the bankers decide it is. You've lost the freedom to hang on to the value of the money that you already worked for. And again, the the, the size of the uplift on the stock market, led by the Wall Street financial issues, only underscores how dependent on that continued flow of instantly created cash Wall Street has become. They're hooked now. They can't stop. So we're going to be heading into Zimbabwe territory here pretty soon with uh, paper notes that say $100 trillion on there. And it's just a piece of paper with ink all over it. All right, we're going to take a call. Rob in Minnesota. Aloha, Rob. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Hi, Mike. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, yeah, I'd like to revisit the, the uh, climate change issue, if I could. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm in Minnesota, a small college town on the river. And uh, so the last two weeks, I went to two different events. And one was uh, put on by a, uh, uh, you know, a probably not so well-known uh, author, uh, Paul Loeb. Uh, he had a book called uh, Soul of the Citizen, and he talks about uh, community activism. And peppered through his whole thing was climate change. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there wasn't anybody really uh, going against it, but you could kind of see everybody kind of nodding their heads, nodding their heads. And, uh, and then, of course, as soon as uh, he was out, he had a kind of a, 
question and answer, and not many people ask questions, and uh, I didn't feel like nailing them too bad. Uh, so I took a uh, well, I did ask a question, question, but it was it was something different. But pretty much all the students just got up and left right away. Well, uh, I mean, last... it, look look at the you know the schools are pushing this in their curriculum. I mean, it's not just the Second Amendment they're rewriting. Uh, the schools are pushing climate change. It's your fault. They're trying to brainwash the kids into going along with this idea that we have to live under a global environmental authority and we, we have to reduce our lifestyle to save the planet Earth. We're seeing all these shows coming out of National Geographic, uh, Science Channel, Discovery, Scientific American. They've been pounding this thing as hard as they can, and a lot of people bought into it. But, of course, here we are some 10, 12 years into this whole global warming hysteria, and people are looking around and realizing the winters are getting colder and harder, and all the prognostications of these so-called experts didn't work out. And now they're trying to scramble and say, well, yeah, I, I guess it didn't happen, but we still are convinced it's happened. You know, and we've been through this before time and again, you know, global warming, global cooling. I, back in the 70s and 80s, they were warning about a new ice age. They don't really know. Now the fact I, that I, no. I, if I could squeeze in here, yeah. I, last week, uh, you know, then I went to a second event, and it was a movie put out by uh, 350.org uh, called "Do the Math," and uh, you know, they're pushing the global warming thing. But it, the, the thing I found interesting was is that it's a common en enemy for us, and they were, you know, going after big oil, and uh, you know, he's cracking uh, jokes about. BP and oil spill, not really jokes, but, you know, stuff. I mean, the guy was engaging. And uh, so at the end of it, I kind of sat around and saw who some of the organizers were. And instead of, you know, going up and challenging them and saying, uh, uh, you know, I don't believe in uh, global warming, I just went up and said, you know, when I first started coming to this city, uh, you know, in 74, you know, I'd take the drive along the river, and we never saw any bald eagles. And because uh, of uh, the, the book Silent Spring, you know, the environmental uh, groups got active, and, uh, you know, now the Eagles have made a, a spectacular comeback. I see them every day. Uh, and I said, and, and I was someone who was involved in keeping the, a, a garbage incinerator out of the city, which, you know, we're in 500-foot bluffs on either side, so it wouldn't have been a good thing to have one right in the city. So I said, I've been an environmentally-minded person all along. I said, the problem I have with car... Um, with climate change is the solution. I can't go along with the carbon tax. And he goes, well, tell me what, what do you mean there? I said, well, if you have a carbon tax, it's going to, all the money is going to go to the same trough where all the money goes now. And all the money, you know, ends up going to all these people that we really don't want to uh, support. Uh, I said, uh, you know, if you, and, and plus just the idea of a carbon tax, if you think carbon is on the elemental table, and, uh, you know, CO2 is a life element. And uh, Thomas Jefferson said, you know, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a carbon tax is basically a tax to destroy life. And uh, they looked at me and they go, well, uh, you know, what do you recommend? And I go, well, you know, I'm just against pollution. So let's put laws against pollution and let's, you know, keep our money local. You know, every time you go spend a dollar at Walmart, uh, you know, it's just going to the corporations. But if you go down to the farmer's market and spend a dollar, you're keeping it local. So, okay, well, you know, you're, you're overlapping a couple of issues there. And by the way, I'm in agreement with doing your uh, food shopping at your local farmer's market. The food is going to be fresher. It's less likely to be GMO or otherwise adulterated. Uh, we're coming up here on a commercial break, uh, and I'm going to have to take this discussion into the next segment. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that climate is always changing, always has, always will. This idea of a stable balance of nature is a wonderful romantic notion. It does not exist. The whole idea is, and this is classic politics, take something that happens all by itself, declare it to be a crisis, and then offer to sell the public a solution. And that's exactly what they did with climate change. Of course, Mother Nature decided not to go along with Al Gore, and the world actually got a lot cooler instead of a lot warmer. Uh, but it is. It's not science. It is political agenda, and they're grabbing the money. Uh, and when we come back, um, I have a response to what your question was to these gentlemen at this meeting. We'll be back after America. This Welcome back to the show. And uh, we're talking with Rob in Minnesota about climate change. And as I was saying before, we went to the commercial break. Climate's always changing. It always has. It always will. 
There has never been a time in the history of planet Earth where the climate was not changing. It happens all the time. But the carbon Nazis decided they were going to take something that was happening naturally, declare it to be a crisis, blame it on humans, and then sell you a solution. Now, there are a lot of different greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The biggest one is water vapor. But you are not going to convince people to pay taxes on the clouds. Methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, even before the NASA study that came out that said carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually a coolant. Most methane in the atmosphere is produced by deep crust microbes and termites, life forms far too intelligent to believe what Al Gore has been saying over these last couple of years. So they settled on carbon dioxide because that they could blame on human activity. But the vast majority of atmospheric carbon dioxide does not come from human activity. So they came up with this whole thing about the, you know, the carbon dioxide that's there is balanced, it's natural, but this tiny fraction, less than a tiny piece of 1% of atmospheric carbon dioxide is coming from human activity, it's going to send the world into a cascade of disaster. Now, in that question about do we solve this with a carbon tax or not, one of Al Gore's own staffers, who genuinely believed they were working on how to avoid global warming, did some calculations and discovered that simply increasing green plant cover by about 15% would completely negate all the effects about additional CO2 and warning. And Al Gore promptly fired him because the goal was to sell carbon credits and carbon taxes. And remember, Al Gore set up his carbon credit exchange with the assistance of Enron's Ken Lay. The goal was to do to planet Earth with carbon dioxide what Enron did to California with electricity. That's what's going on. Remember, Al Gore's not a scientist. He's a politician. He didn't even get good grades in his science classes when he went to college. We've got Al Gore on videotape saying the temperature of the Earth's core is millions of degrees. And it isn't. He's a goofball. It was another hoax to part you from your money and obedience. Rob, got anything else you want to add? I, you know, Mike, I'm, agree, I'm in agreement with you a whole lot. You know, I, you're one of the smartest guys I know, and your sci- scientific mind is uh, is way up there. You know, you're a lot smarter than I am on, on science. But, uh, and, you know, to deal with... Uh, to deal with the general public that's been fed all this stuff, we can't, you know, if you just go out and say uh, climate, you know, change is a hoax, and, and believe me, I live in Minnesota, so we know about climate change. Yes. You know, that's the standing joke. You know, if, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it'll be, it'll change. But we say the same thing here in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure that's all over the place. Oh, it's been, uh, it's been it's sun and rain alternating all during the show today. Yeah. Anyway, you know, one of the other points I, I I made was, you know, you know, look at our economy. You know, when we, I mean, the environmental movement, you know, fought long and hard to clean up smokestack gases. We had, you know, rivers that used to start on fire, and we've cleaned up rivers quite a bit. And the environmental movement has fought long and hard. But that's when we had a middle class. I said, now that we, you know, and back when uh, Ross Pro was running, you know, he talked about the giant sucking sound, and so, you know, all the jobs leaving the country and you know what's happened well we've eliminated the middle class and so people are afraid to speak up because what little income they have they don't want to you know put their job on the line for uh you know for being uh, going against the grain and so in the meantime all of uh, these jobs have gone over to china where they don't have any uh environmental movement and the smokestacks and the you know and they're polluting the water, the, the mm-hmm. air, and everything. And I says, that pollution knows no bounds. It, you know, it doesn't recognize uh, borders. So all the gains that we made here have been lost. And on a global scale, you know, you know, I said, so we have to, you know, refocus our efforts. But the biggest point I'm trying to make is, you know, I've been listening to you for a long, long time. And, you know, I've gotten a great education out of it. And, uh, but if you're going to go out and talk to the average person on the street that's been listening to mainstream media, you kind of have to approach them with kid gloves. And if you, you know, go out and say global warming is a hoax, you know, they mm-hmm. might laugh you off. But if, if you say, uh, well, you know, uh, 
think about all the environmental uh, stuff that we, all the progress that we've made in this country, and now we've given it all back because the corporations have taken your job. Uh, well, basically, China the environmental movement got hijacked, and the biggest hijacker. Uh, well, we, I know that too, but I, you know, once again, I'm talking to the man on the street. And okay. So, well, let, let me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let you go here, Rob, because I want to finish okay, up thanks, and get I, to another phone call. Um, the environmental movement, like the original feminists, started with laudable ideals that we could all support, but the opportunists saw a chance to come in and hijack those movements for their own purposes. Uh, just like the early feminists were all about equity feminism, which we could all support, equal pay, equal work, equal access to the education and credit. Can't argue with that. Can't argue with that. Then the uh, gender feminists came in, took over, and started screaming, all men are rapists and uh, trying to seek uh, special privileges uh, for women and limitations on men. And, of course, nobody could support that. The same thing is true of the environmental movement. The early environmentalists have... A valid point. We have to take care of our planet. We only get the one. But then it got seized on by opportunists who said, hey, I can use this to advance my political power or to uh, extract wealth from uh, the masses. The biggest abuser of all, of course, was Richard Nixon when he formed the EPA, ostensibly to protect the nation's environment, but in actuality to grab huge chunks of public land to use as collateral for government borrowing. And the same thing is true with Al Gore. Oh, everybody loves the environment and they love the earth. Let's come up with a villain that we can blame on people. I know it'll be carbon dioxide. And they were off and running. And they spent millions and millions of dollars selling this to you, the American people. And I agree with Rob that when you're talking to the uninitiated and the media brainwashed, that you have to be gentle about it. You can't shove them across that bridge. You have to stand on the opposite side and beckon them forward. And you usually start with something... Uh, simple that they can understand. Ten years ago, the global warming movement said snow is going to be a thing of the past. Here we are. We've had four or five record-setting winters, and it looks like we're going to get another one. And again, I think right now the, uh, the mental climate, if you will, of the American people is very different. They'd sort of grudgingly admitted they got lied to about Saddam's nuclear weapons. Now with this very bogus claim about Assad and gas weapons, Americans are now finally blinking the sleep out of their eyes and realizing this government lies about everything. Why not about global warming? Especially when deliberate fraud has already been demonstrated and the dire warnings of what was going to happen if we didn't buy their carbon credits have not come to pass. It's, you know, anybody who says, oh, there's no such thing as a giant conspiracy against the people, we've got one right here staked out, naked on the ground for you to study because the, the global warming hoax involved the United States government, NASA, NOAA, Penn State, Hadley CRU, the IPCC up at the United Nations, and on and on and on. They all got on the bandwagon. They sold out their science in exchange for increased funding and media attention. And it, it turned out to be a hoax, a complete, absolute hoax. Climate on Earth is driven by two factors. Solar activity, which is in a minimum right now. Looks like we may be going into a new Maunder minimum, which will lead to a new little ice age, or even a worse ice age. And the other dominant factor, of course, is the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, because it doesn't stay the same. It oscillates over 100,000-year cycles between being circular and more elliptical. And when it's more elliptical, because of Kepler's laws of orbital motion, the Earth spends more of its time further away from the Sun than close to the Sun, and that's where you get the ice ages. And as the orbit becomes circular, you get the interglacial periods. And until these carbon Nazis can control the output of the Sun or change the shape of the Earth's orbit, all the carbon taxes in the world are not going to change the fact that Earth's climate will change from now on. All right, grab a quick phone call here. Fred in Michigan. Fred, aloha. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, well, the recurring realities of the gassing that you mentioned is uh, one historic precedent that has been perpetrated on a recurring basis by the Israeli Mossad. Uh, veteran filmmaker James Longley, uh, Gaza Strip, documents this fact he actually films idea helicopters uh, gassing uh, densely populated areas of the Gaza Strip, of course, densely populated with Arab people, with, uh, with nerve gas, of course. Mm -hmm. That's on film. That's called Gaza Strip. Uh, and then, of course, if most people, I'm sure, in the audience have never heard this, but they can read it 
as I did in a book. Um, Oh, I hear the music. Yeah, we're going to have to take a break for commercials. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to let you go here, and I'm going to be back Hi, with our America, last segment. Welcome back to the show. And following on the story that we reported earlier, where this uh, high school textbook literally rewrote the Second Amendment to brainwash our children into thinking they're not allowed to have guns unless they are in some kind of government-controlled militia, which is not what the Second Amendment says, and the Supreme Court has already ruled on this. Now we're getting a story from Ben Swan. I just linked it to the front page of WhatReallyHappened.com. This is out of South Carolina, where apparently parents noticed that uh, uh, their, their, their daughter had come home after taking a, uh, a quiz on the Bill of Rights. And uh, I'm going to read you what the question was that aroused their ire. Question uh, number 10. Mr. Jones' gun was confiscated by the police at a traffic stop, even though he showed them the proper permit and license for ownership of the gun. Is this situation constitutional? The student answered no, because it is not constitutional, and the teacher forced her to change her answer to yes. Now... I've already gotten other emails from people, and if, uh, now's the time for all you parents to take a good look at what your, your schools are teaching your kids, because they're not teaching them the truth. They're feeding them more lies. Uh, apparently, this advanced placement uh, textbook, uh, where they rewrote the Second Amendment, uh, these are created by the uh, College Board, which is an organization that is participating in the implementation of Common Core the educational standards being put forward by the federal government. In other words, the federal government is forcing the schools to lie to your children about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's brainwashing. That's mind control. Right out of Hitler's Nazi Germany, right out of Stalin's Soviet Union, it is there in your face. They are stealing your children's birthright under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And if they're doing it to your kids, they were probably doing it to you. So you better go back and look at all the things you were taught in school and start examining them, whether that was true or not. I know in school I was taught there was a Spanish mine in Havana Harbor. In school I was taught the Lusitania was not carrying military cargo. And I remember when I was uh, in uh, grade school, very young, and we had this textbook called Our American Heritage. And I remember it because it had this beautiful painting of a riverboat on the front cover, which I thought was just very romantic. And I remember vividly the cartoons that were in there demonizing the Soviet Union. They were all scowling and pointing machine guns at their people. And there were signs saying, you know, vote yes or else. And I grew up with that image of citizens from the Soviet Union until I actually finally met some when I was with NASA, and they were just really nice people. They didn't rip my head off and try and cram socialized medicine down my neck. They were really nice people. They were not the monsters I had been told that they were going to be. Just like the Iranian people are not the monsters you're being told they are. Just like the Syrian people are not the monsters you're being told they are. We're in a watershed moment where the American people are waking up and realizing this government rules you through lies, fraud, and deception. And now the question before the board here, are you willing to live under a government that lies to you about everything? And I can't imagine that any of you are going to be really comfortable with that. Because when you live under a government and a corporate media that lies to you as much as these do, and Americans are the most lied to people on the face of the earth, you can't know what's going on in the real world. You can't know the real state of the economy. You can't really know whether these wars are just or not. Because you're being lied to. And I will not tolerate a government that lies. The Declaration of Independence says that governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I do not consent to be lied to. There is nothing in the Constitution that authorizes the government to propagandize the people. It's not in there. When this government lies to you about Assad's gas, about Saddam's nukes, about human-caused global warming... 
They are acting illegally and unconstitutionally, and at that moment they cease to be the legitimate government of this nation. I will have a truthful government or I will have no government at all. It comes down to that. Because I am sick and tired of all the lies. And I don't believe them any longer, and neither do you. And so it's going to come down to that personal choice. Are you willing to put up with this? More to the point, are you willing to leave your children to a government that will lie to them, to trick them into wars, to trick them out of money and obedience, to blind them to what the world really is, to hold them prisoners? We're in a real-life version of the movie Matrix. The government and the corporate media have crafted this very expensive, complicated illusion around us to turn us into their slaves so that our labor is siphoned off to power their wealth and their wars of conquest. It's time to take that red pill. And most people are. And they know it. That's why we've got the, you know, Carrie's out there saying, oh, this gosh darn internet making it impossible to govern the people. Well, governance in its original definition was a mechanism that acted only when it needed to, like the spin governor on a steam engine. As long as the steam engine's running normally, you don't do anything. It's only when it overspeeds that uh, the governor comes into play. But these days in Washington, D.C., governance means control of everything in absolute tyrannical fashion. We used to live in a country where you could pretty much do what you want until the government said, eh, you shouldn't do this. Now we live in a country where you need permission from the government to do anything at all. And we're seeing these stories about how the public education system funded by your tax dollars is being used to steal from your children their birthright under the Bill of Rights. They are lying to your children about what the Second Amendment actually says. They're lying to your children about the constitutionality of police confiscation of law-abiding citizens' guns. We are in Stasi territory here. We're in KGB territory here. The Americans who went to their graves in World War I and World War II thought they were opposing governments who treated their people as property. And it is an insult to the memory of those who made that ultimate sacrifice to see the United States acting just like those nations that were invaded and conquered. It's time to make that decision. It's time to talk about this with your friends and neighbors. Are you willing to live with a government that lies to you at all, let alone constantly? Because you've got to make that choice and be prepared to live with the consequences of that choice. If you say, yeah, I'm okay with the government lying to you, your life is no longer your own. Because the government's going to go on telling you whatever they think is going to get you to do what they want you to do. There's no freedom of choice there. There's no freedom at all when you're ruled with lies, fraud, and deception. They'll just tell you whatever it takes to get you to choose of your own free will to do what they want you to do. Throw your children onto the Syrian bayonets. Throw your children onto the Iranian bayonets. Throw your children onto the Russian and Chinese bayonets. Go on surrendering what little is left of your wealth so they can prop up Wall Street. Has this government shown any indication of changing its behavior toward the American people over the last 20 years? I haven't seen it. It's gotten worse. Constant NSA spying on us all. Harassment. Department of Homeland Security harassing peaceful protesters. Firing tear gas, tear gas canisters right at the heads of Occupy Wall Street protesters. Infiltration, subversion, sabotage, COINTELPRO on steroids. Is that the kind of nation you want to leave to your children? We are at a crisis point right now, and a global nuclear war is our worst-case scenario, and the Warhawks still want it. All right, I hear the music. It's time to get out of here. 
We will be back here tomorrow on Thursday on the Republic Broadcasting Network. And one more reminder that the Republic Broadcasting fundraising drive is continuing. Please go to republicbroadcasting.org, hit that little donate button, or even better, go over to Republic Trading Group, buy your physical silver and gold from them. They'll give you a good deal, and a portion of those sales proceeds go to fund our network. Please share what you know with everyone you know. Call those congressional and White House comment lines and say, we know you're lying. Cut it out. No more wars. We'll be back tomorrow. Aloha, America. Thank you.